Hello. Thank you all for uh, joining um, for our session on cloud native storage, um, where we're going to talk about what the CNCF does in our storage tag um, and cover a little bit of an intro of what cloud native storage is and some of the projects in the space and some of the um, efforts we've been working on white papers and disaster recovery and performance. So my name is Alex Kirkop, and I'm here with uh, my co-presenters, Raffaele Aspasoli and Jin Yang, um, both of who you've probably seen around um, in other talks. Um, so what are we covering today? Today we're talking about, uh, we want to give you a little bit of an overview of the tag um, and what it does and, and why we're here and, and what we do in the CNCF. We're going to talk a little bit about why cloud native is important and some of the white papers and documents that we've been working on. And finally, we want to hear from you. We want to talk a little bit about the community. So um, please feel free to um, reach out during the talk or after the talk, and, and we'd love to hear your questions and, and find out um, how best we can, we can help the community. So a little bit about the tag. The tag is, um, uh, could, you might have known them in the past as the CNCF SIGs. The tags were, were kind of renamed because we kept getting confused with the Kubernetes SIGs, which are uh, a distinctly different organization. What we're here to do is um, to, to work with the community in the CNCF with, um, with a, an open community, so all our calls are open and all of the, uh, all of the work that we do is, is, is freely available on, on our um, repos and we'd, we'd love you to have a look and, uh, and, and help us out. So who are we? It's a complete mix of people. We have um, vendors, different experts, various independent contributors working with um, cloud native technologies, mostly with a storage focus. A storage focus. Um, the tag is, uh, has a number of co-chairs and, and, and tech leads, and we're always looking for additional members to, to, to join both in our calls and, and as, as potential leads. And I'll explain a little bit more what we, what we do in, in that space. So please feel free to reach out directly to us, um, uh, connect to our mailing list and, or, our, or the CNCF Slack where we're always online. So what do we do? The tags were put in to help scale the CNCF, right? And to scale the TOC and the work that they do with all of the different projects. We've, we've the, the, the CNCF has gone from uh, a, a few projects to now dozens of projects, and in the sandbox category, we have over 80 projects at, at the, as of the last count. So, so what we're what we're here to do is to provide the storage experience to the to the TOC and to help the TOC scale and, and help make them make make ultimately the best decisions for the community. But in all cases, the TOC remains the ultimate decision-making body, and, that's, and, the, and those are the elected members uh, of the CNCF. So what does it mean? We work on providing educational resources and white papers to help the community understand what cloud native storage is. We, are, um, we, are that, we, we provide the expertise to review projects as they go from sandbox to incubating to graduated. Um, and we provide uh, uh, expertise into some of those annual reviews as well. And of course, we work with the community and events like today uh, and provide subject matter expertise whenever the TOC requires, requires that help. Um, and these are some of the projects which, which are in the CNCF portfolio that, that connect storage. Um, some of these are extremely well known, you know, like etcd, which I'm sure each one of you is using on a, on a day to day basis with, with every Kubernetes uh, deployment. But there are projects like um, Rook that's, that act as operators for, for Ceph, for example, with Vitesse and TIKV, which are distributed databases or distributed key value stores. Harbor, which is a, a, container, um, a container image repository, um, as well as other, uh, other projects like Dragonfly, CubeFS, and Longhorn that are in the incubation uh, stages. Now, each of those CNCF projects is listed on the CNCF website, uh, and we have there's a long list of, of sandbox projects which are also listed under under the CNCF website under under URLs in that sheet. And each of those each of those projects tends to go through through a cycle where we have sandbox projects which are very focused on 
um, providing a, you know, a low bar of entry into the CNCF where they can actually um, experiment on different technologies, collaborate with other projects, find overlaps, um, but also work on you know, building out their community and building out the, the, the criteria that will help them ultimately to get into incubation stage. Incubation stage is where, um, is, where is, is, is actually one of the highest bars uh, for, for the project to achieve, and this is when projects are being used um, in multiple production environments and they have um, a healthy roadmap, a healthy number of committers, and you know the project metrics are, are, are showing the, the, the wide adoption of those projects. Um, and then graduation, uh, graduated projects are, are where we have, um, where, where we add additional criteria like security audits to make sure that, that those projects are, are useful, are, are used by some of the largest mainstream environments. Um, so, a little bit about cloud native storage. Some of you might be very familiar with this, some of you might be new to this, but why should you think about it and why is this important? Well, I'll put something up in amber which might be a little controversial, but I think that there is no such thing as a stateless application. Um, and why is that? Because ultimately all applications are storing state somewhere and sometimes you're storing state in files and sometimes it's in key values and sometimes it's in objects and sometimes it's uh, in databases, but all of those applications need, need a way to store their state. And so what, you know, when we're looking at cloud native storage, we kind of see this, this huge necessary adoption where um, typically a lot of those stateful workloads used to be outside of Kubernetes and now as, we've, uh, as we continue to get further adoption, those stateful workloads start moving into Kubernetes to take advantage, of course, of all of the automation, the scale, the performance, the automated failovers. And we'll talk a little bit about some of those attributes um, when Jing talks about our white paper and, and, and when Raffaele talks about things like disaster recovery in, in, cloud, native, uh, in cloud native workloads. And the thing is, cloud native storage is here to stay, right? We, we have a very broad ecosystem. There are literally hundreds of um, vendors and hundreds of drivers that, that interact with, with Kubernetes with different capabilities. And we'll talk a little bit about some of those capabilities in the white paper discussion. Um, and more and more we're seeing um, operators um, to help deploy and manage the automation of these stateful workloads like databases, like message queues, like, like key value stores, et cetera. Um, and, and so many more uh, uh, different use cases, which you'll find in some of the talks uh, today and tomorrow, as well as you know, in, if, you, if you visit the, the sponsor area, you'll, you'll find lots of examples of this. So one of the things that we, that, we, um, that we wanted to do as part of our education on cloud native storage was to give some clear indications of the differences between, um, between the different cloud native storage attributes. So I'll pass it over to Jing, who's going to talk to us about um, the white paper that we developed. Thanks, Alex. So I'm going to talk about our uh, white paper on cloud native uh, storage. Uh, in this white paper, we described what are the attributes of uh, storage systems and what are the different layers in the storage solution and how they impact different attributes of a storage system. We talked about the data access interfaces and the uh, orchestration and the management interfaces. Sorry. Yeah. Storage systems have some storage attributes such as availability, scalability, performance, consistency, and durability. Availability refers to the ability to access to the data when there is a failure. And this can be measured by uptime, like the percentage of availability. For example, 99.99% uh, .99 uh, of uh, uptime. Scalability is measured by the ability to scale across the number of clients, the number of operations, throughput, capacity, the number of components. Performance is measured by latency, the number of operations per second, the throughput. Consistency refers to the ability to access to newly created data 
or updates after it's committed. This can be either eventual, consistent, or uh, strongly consistent. And durability is affected by the layer of data protection, uh, the level of redundancy, uh, and also the endurance of the storage media and the ability to detect corruption and recover from the recover data from that failure. Storage systems typically have layers or stacks that affects the storage attributes. But rather than uh, directly access resources, a hypervisor could be uh, access the resources, and in this case, it could, could add the access overhead. And storage topology refers to the arrangement of the storage and the compute resources and the relationship, the data link between them, and that includes centralized, distributed, sharded, or hyper-converged topologies. Storage systems typically have a data protection layer that adds redundancy. So here we refer to RAID, uh, erasure coding, or replicas. Storage systems typically have data services in addition to the core services, such as replication, snapshots, clones, and so on. And ultimately, storage system will persist data at a physical storage layer, which is normally non-volatile, and this will affect the overall performance and uh, long-term durability. And now let's look at data access interfaces. In this diagram, uh, we have workloads, the, the container consume stor storage system through data access interfaces. There are two types of uh, data access interfaces as shown here. One is volumes, that is the interface supported by the container orchestration systems, including block and file systems. And the other type is the uh, APIs. Here we refer to object store, key value store, uh, databases. Um, so for the object store, we do have a project called COSI, Container Object Storage Interface, that is aimed at adding object storage support into Kubernetes in that project reach the alpha stage in 1.25 release of Kubernetes. And now let's look at the orchestration and management interfaces. This control plane interface here refers to the storage interfaces supported directly by the container orchestration systems, such as uh, CSI, Container Storage Interface, the uh, Docker volume driver interface, or other native interfaces. And note that Flex Volume is deprecated in Kubernetes 1.23 release. So if you are using uh, Flex Volume, please uh, move to CSI driver as soon as possible. And we have this uh, orange box here, frameworks and tools. Uh, so this is an extension of the control plane interfaces. For example, we can have a operator for uh, a key value store or databases to help the workload to work in Kubernetes. Uh, so that's uh, all we have for the storage landscape white paper. Uh, so now uh, I'm going to talk about a new initiative that we just get started in tech storage. We're working on this use case template based on the CNCF storage landscape white paper. It's still work in progress, but once it's ready, we want to invite uh, cloud native open source projects to fill out the template and give a presentation at the tech storage meeting. And then eventually we will publish those use cases at our GitHub repo. So here's an example use case. Uh, this is still work in progress, so I just used the uh, CD as an example here. Uh, so, uh, so here's a description with, of uh, what is ETCD, what are the storage attributes. So it's a distributed key value store. It has a strong consistency. Um, 
and it's a CP database, meaning that it supports consistency uh, and partition tolerance at the expense of uh, availability. So you can't serve write requests if quorum is not satisfied. And also it uh, uh, supports, uh, provides a st stability, reliability, scalability, and performance. And EDCD, um, so Benjamin Wong from EDC team did a presentation on June 8th of this year, so I have added link here. And looking at uh, storage topology, ETCD is distributed, uh, and it's a key value store. And from the data protection point of view, it's, it has replicas, and it has replication and snapshots. And so this is something still work in progress. If you are interested, please uh, join our tag and join the, co the discussions. So, so just to follow on from, from those templates, one of the things we are looking for and, and we'd, we'd love to hear your input is which types of use cases and which types of templates we should be working on and, and, and document next. And we're looking at you know, members from different projects, databases, for example, open source uh, projects that, that work on stateful workloads um, and, and build out these templates to effectively help end users to, to, to figure out their, their stateful workloads. Now, one of the things that you know, we talked about in the storage white paper, and, and I heartily recommend that you have a read of that, is we wanted to get an understanding of the different attributes and how they interact with each other, right? Because each of the different um, layers in a storage system and each of the, you know, the topologies and the architecture of that system will affect you know, one, of those, um, one of those attributes. Um, and typically you have compromises to make, right? Between the consistency versus the performance or the availability versus the scale and, and, and all of these sorts of uh, decisions. So we, we then came to the conclusion that one of the most common things that, that, uh, that we were getting requests for from the, from the uh, end users was how do we focus then deeper into some of those attributes? And, and, and we focused on um, uh, performance and, and came up with this performance white paper and also availability with our disaster recovery white paper. Um, and one of, the, one of the interesting things with the performance white paper was we were, we were looking at the different ways you can, you can reliably um, compare and benchmark uh, applications within your cloud native environment, within your Kubernetes environment. And so we focused on two main areas. One is how do you performance benchmark the, the, the volumes and, and that might be available from your uh, different storage systems or cloud providers. And then secondly, how do you um, benchmark and, and, and manage um, databases? Because that, that was also a very common uh, solution. And as we were going through this, we, we obviously, and I'm, you know, hands up, I'm a very big performance nerd, and maybe some of you are too, but one of the things that, that we realized was it's actually one of the most complex things to, to, to do apple for apple um, benchmarks across these different environments, right? Because, um, and, it, and it became almost just as important to explain how to do it, it was explaining some of the pitfalls that, that, you, that, that, that you might you know, come across. So for example, figuring out whether you wanted to, to measure um, what's more important for your, for your particular work, was it the operations or the throughput, or, or, or figuring out the overhead that some of the different layers and topology might, 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 pro might provide, like you know, the different types of data protection or, or, the, or encryption or security, and how all of those things affect the latency and the overall um, throughput of the system, but also how you figure out the different concurrencies. You know, sometimes you might find that the clients might be the bottleneck rather than, rather than the storage system. Um, and in all of these sorts of things, we came across so many examples where, where um, end users might be doing the wrong things. Like for example, you know, benchmarking systems that had really big caches with really small volumes, for example. And I can't, I can't tell you how many benchmarks there are out there, you know, published on the internet where, where you know, we say, oh, we're delivering five gigabytes per second on a disk that only supports 200 megabytes a second. And, and you kind of say, okay, well, you're clearly just benchmarking the cache at that stage and you're not actually benchmarking the volume, right? So these are the sort of things that, that's, that we caught out. Um, 
heartily recommend that you read the paper because there's lots of learnings in there. But one of the key takeaways is don't always focus, in fact, almost never focus on you know, published benchmarks that are often marketing um, uh, material. And it's really important to actually measure the performance in your environment because there are so many things that can affect the performance all the way from you know, the nodes, the network, the environment, the orchestrators, the storage systems, and, and the types of file systems and databases and everything else in the stack that you really need to test these things in your, in your specific environments with your specific tools. So, so the paper gives you those tools and, and, and those methods to help you do that in, in, in your environment. Um, and now I'm gonna hand over to Raffaele, who's gonna talk about our failover and disaster recovery. Thank you, Alex. Um, so cloud native disaster recovery, while I get ready here, uh, this one. much okay perfect so by the way thank you for um, you all for coming it's um, it's so numerous it's a, it's really a pleasure for us to see so many of you and to see the interest so cloud native disaster recovery um, th th there is a question right that probably you are you're wondering sh does disaster recovery change in any way with the cloud native approach to things and in this uh, white paper we submit to you that it might change, right? It probably should, but for sure there are there is a new way to do things that uh, we should all be aware of, and then be able to make our choices. So, what are the difference between traditional DR and cloud native di uh, disaster recovery? We we created this. Well, the white paper obviously go in depth, but we created this table here to uh, try to summarize them, right? So, in terms of deployment. With the traditional DR, usually you have active, passive type of deployment. So if you have two data centers, you have one data center serving the traffic and another data center is passive and it's there just to take over if there is a disaster. With cloud native DR, we want to do active, active deployments. So uh, all the instances of our stateful workload can receive uh, writes and reads. Uh, there are no passive in instances. And then uh, the detection of the disaster in uh, traditional DR, usually it's a human decision. So there is an incident, there is some problem, and somebody decides, okay, let's trigger the disaster recovery procedure, and then a bunch of things need to happen, right? And that's why, because there are humans involved, that's why companies typically do maybe uh, biannual disaster recovery exercises to make sure that the procedure actually works, right? For cloud native DR, we want the uh, detection of the disaster to be automatic. And then um, the disaster recovery itself, right? Usually in, in traditional DR, it's a mix of automation and human actions. Uh, you know, if you're, mo if you're more, if you're mature, maybe you have automated everything, but it's a, in generally it's a mix. And uh, instead in cloud native DR, we want it to be fully, fully automated. And then RTO and RPO, recovery time objective and recovery point objective, these are the two main uh, metrics or KPI, KPI that you use to measure the efficiency of your disaster recovery. Um, so recovery time objective is how, how long does the system stay down, right? It's not available. And for traditional DR, you have from uh, close to zero, if you're very good, to hours, right? Uh, because it takes hours maybe just, just to decide that there is a problem and then, and then to start recovering. But for cloud native DR, we want it to be close to zero. Essentially, a few well checks have to fail and then, and then we decide that it's a disaster and we start, um, we start uh, recovering. And for recovery point objective, which is how many, you know, uh, how long of um, time span of transaction do I, did I lose because of the disaster, um, for traditional DR, it, it depends on depends a lot on how you do data replication and backup and restore. But it could be could be from zero to hours again, right? But for uh, cloud native DR, we want uh, to be able to have a, exactly zero RPO if you're doing um, if you're doing, especially if you're doing strongly consistent deployments. 
And then from a more a process perspective, the owner of um, DR has always been the application or the business unit. But in traditional, in traditional enterprises, what this team do usually is to turn to storage, the storage team, and, and ask, what can you give me in terms of SLA and SLO for recovery of, of the storage? And then that, that becomes their strategy. So really, the storage team owns the strategy for disaster recovery. But in Cloud Native DR, what we have noticed is that it's because, because this, there is a new generation of middleware that can be used to do this kind of cloud native disaster recovery. And then this middleware uh, project or products are chosen by the application teams, then they become really the owner of the strategy and the process. And then in terms of capabilities, traditional DR um, uses very storage oriented capabilities like backup, restore, or volume replication, synchronous or asynchronous. But in Cloud Native DR, we need more network-oriented capability, capabilities. We need um, the ability to communicate east-west, and by that I mean if you have multiple data centers, there, is, there need to be a way to communicate between data centers, and, and <coughs> that's, that's the way, that's the path that the uh, middleware, the smart uh, middleware is going to use to sync the transaction. And then we need uh, global load balancers that are smart enough to detect if an application is available or not and trigger automatically the recovery procedure. So what, what can you find in this uh, white paper? <coughs> so we have this definition and then we have some, some other um, definition around the concept of failure domain, high availability and di disaster recovery. We have some reasoning around the CAP theorem. Um, it's, uh, it's very important to, to understand the CAP theorem to, uh, to also comprehend how, it, because it, 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 it um, lays down the rules of, um, of a stateful distributed workload and now, can, and now that they can work in, in a situation of failure. Um, so if you're like me, you see some white hair here. Um, when I went to school, they didn't, they weren't teaching uh, the, <laughs> the CAP theorem. I had to study it myself. I suggest everyone that, that is working in the storage um, area to, to go up and to study up on it. It's, it's really important. And then uh, we have, um, we look at the anatomy of this new generation of fully distributed stateful workloads and the concept of shards um, and replicas. And then we look at some consensus protocol and um, some reference architecture. So I have some examples here, but you can, you can find more about this in the white paper. <coughs> so for example, um, when, with regard to the anatomy of a stateful application, what will you find is that uh, distributed work, stateful workloads all have the concept of replicas and shards. Maybe they call shard partitions and replicas, they are called something else, but they all have these concepts. So replicas are used to provide high availability, right, because I replicate the data to multiple failure domains, and shards are used to provide high scalability because they are used to split the request in, into multiple parallel processes that can elaborate more, um, more requests uh, so that um, they, this, this kind of workloads can scale beyond what a monolithic database or a monolithic cache can ever uh, do. Uh, and, and it's interesting, so replicas and shards need to coordinate replicas because they, they you know, these are processes that they have to, to sync and have always the same view of the state, right? And shards sometimes need to co coordinate because you may have a transaction that involves multiple shards. So we did some research to see amongst the most common uh, stateful you know, workloads, and there are more here. If, if your favorite is missing, <laughs> I apologize, we can add it to the, to the white paper. But we did some research to understand what, what protocols they were using, because uh, understanding the protocols gives you a, a good idea of what the workload can do. So if you're doing, for example, a software selection, uh, this is a good idea to dissect 
the, the, the product and really understand what happens. So for replicas, consensus protocols, the two most used are Raft and Paxos, as you can see. And going forward, it's going to be always Raft because Paxos uh, is a little bit more difficult to implement. And um, for shared consensus, uh, there are various options. One of the most used is uh, the two-phase commit protocol. And here, for exa an example of uh, a reference architecture, this is for deploying a strongly consistent workload on Kubernetes. So um, be for the cap theorem, we need the three availability zones in order to have a strong consistency, and we need to select a workload that has cho chosen to be consistent uh, because if you have two choices for the cap theorem, you, you can choose to be consistent or you can choose to be available during a network partition. So here we have we pretend to have a consistent, uh, strong and consistent workload and three failure domains. And what happens when one of the region goes down is that the global load balancer need, needs to figure that out and re reroute the traffic to the healthy uh, availability zones or regions, and uh, the workload will automatically readjust to the situation. Uh, there are more information, there's more information in the, in, the, in the white paper, and we also take into account uh, um, eventually consistent workloads. And that's it. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Um, so finally, I just wanted to finish off before we go into questions with um, a little uh, very blatant recruitment. We'd love you to join our community. We'd love to hear you. We'd love to hear from your stateful workloads and your, and your projects and the challenges that you're seeing in, in this space. Um, please uh, feel free to join our meeting. It's open to all. It's on the second or fourth um, uh, Wednesday of every month. Um, and we've seen, you know, if, if, if you only join just to listen, that's fine too. You can find information about um, tons of different projects who have presented over, over the period uh, and participate in the discussions and we'd love to hear from you. So, so with that, I'll hand over to, to questions. Just to say, please wait for the microphone because these sessions are recorded. It's very helpful. Um, I have a question. This deck seems to be kind of focused on a single application. And there you can get what we call technical consistency of that single application. But in a disaster recovery, what is important for us is business consistency. And that's also deals with the order that applications are brought back. Is that anywhere in the white paper described or in the definitions? Yeah, and now consistency is, um, I, th I think across applications comes into play when you do backups and restore, because you need to back up at the same, all, all of these applications at the same time. But, but for online, I, I see you disagree, but for, on, for this kind of workloads, if you need consistency across, across state of a workload, you need to do a dual write, essentially. A, a write that is consistent across, across multiple state of workloads. And at that point, it, that write either, either goes or doesn't, but there is no risk of inconsistency. I'm not talking about the restore. Eh? If a data center goes down, it is an atomic event, but it is a durable event, unless there's a nuclear bomb. But if there's a fire or a flooding, not all systems will go down at the same time. Mm -hmm. So you have a period of minutes, maybe even hours, that the systems are out of sync. You're, you're you're perfectly right. I think in you know in in many typical disaster recovery scenarios, you don't have that big bang event that takes out an entire data center. You 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 perhaps have a fire or a flooding or something, and and racks go out over a period of time, and you are hampered by the fact that you can't access the data center during that period, so you have no control over it. 
But I think this is where some of the patterns that we see in, in cloud native and, and using you know, Kubernetes and orchestration come into play, right? Because the different workloads can have, um, can, can be declaratively designed with their dependencies and the different you know, service models, et cetera, such that they actually do start in the right order and, and, and things might fail health checks because one of their dependencies failed, for example, and they can be shut down and then restarted in the, in the right place. So, so I think um, it's a long-winded answer of saying it depends, but, but there are the technologies available to do it. And I, and I would argue that it becomes an order of magnitude easier when you're using you know, cloud native to do that. Yeah, but you use availability zone and region quite freely as interdependent. Or, or, and I think doing a disaster recovery across regions will never be zero. Cannot be zero. Yeah, this new generation of workloads can be stretched across regions. And we did experiments and uh, load tested them. So if so we did we we simulated disasters where we took down an entire AWS region or actually isolated network, right? Because <laughs> we can't take it down. But um, and the workload reacted uh, seamlessly. Right? It moved it moved the the work the um, the traffic to the other available regions. So for the workload, really, it doesn't matter. It's it's all about the availability zones. It doesn't matter if uh, sorry the failure domains. It doesn't matter if a failure domain is a machine, an AZ, or a region. Um, it will always react. What changes is really the latency, right? If you want to stretch across multiple regions, processing a single transaction will take longer, right? Can, can your use case afford to take longer? That's really the question. But they don't have any problem to be geographically distributed. Um, I, I did tests with North America, but I could have stretched across Europe and it would have worked. Thank you, any other questions? Anyone? Yell, wave, anyone? Okay, final thoughts? Well, fantastic. Thank you again, everyone, for joining us, and we'd love to see you in our polls.